you're welcome. And uh, let me just tell you for a moment our, what our next program is going to be in February, uh, uh, March 11th, also the, the same day of the month, March 11th. Uh, our speaker will be Mr. George Harwood Phillips, who is a historian and a working musician. And he will be talking about his new book, The Toonsmith and the Lyricist, which basically tells a story of American, the evolution of American popular music and culture through the prism of the creation of one song, I Can't Get Started With You, which sounds like an interesting premise, and we're always looking for unique perspectives on history. So he will be the speaker in March. And now I'm uh, our, uh, talking a little bit about our speaker today. Today is Marilyn McPhee, who will be speaking on Westward Ho, Tales from Pioneer Times. And she is a professional storyteller, a resident of San Diego County with a degree in English and French literature. She's the president of the Storytellers of San Diego and a California State Liaison for the National Storytelling Network. She's been telling stories professionally since 1985. Some of you may have seen her before. And Late venues like Oasis and maybe the Rachel Bernardo Library, where she's a regular speaker. She's been a regular speaker uh, at a number of venues and has spoken for all kinds of groups from preschool to adult and from coast to coast. And please join me in welcoming Miss Marilyn McCoy. Great to see a friend of mine that I have for the second time in a week that I haven't seen otherwise for several years. So it's wonderful to be here. I'm really, really, I'm really, really happy to be here and be able to share some stories with you. I know that when Rachel emailed me, he said, "Well, um, we have a projector and a computer, and uh, you know, I said you'll be bringing your presentation on PowerPoint." And I said, "Oh no, <laughs> I'm a storyteller. It's pretty low tech. It's just stories, and it's just me." So I want to tell you some stories, some of them with some specific San Diego connections, all of them with some pioneer time connections. Now let me start with this one. It's a story of Charlotte, very Charlotte. Now the story starts in a little town in Maine. Charlotte was the prettiest girl in town, but it was a little town. Well still, she was the prettiest girl in town. She was petite, fine figure, long golden curls, big blue eyes, and uh, she was rich, too. <laughs> her father was a wealthy merchant. Her parents hadn't started out wealthy. They were both immigrants. But due to some, some good luck and some hard work and persistence, they'd become quite successful. And they had one child and adored her and gave her whatever she wanted. And what she wanted more than anything else was a little bit bigger stage to shine on. And so when she heard that the, that the governor of the state, who just lived a few towns over, was going to have a New Year's Eve ball, she was pretty excited about that. And so she made a list and started with the most important thing, and that was, of course, the dress. Got to say yes to the dress, right? And so she went to the finest dressmaker in town and secured her services, which was good for a couple of things. It meant that she would have the services of the finest dressmaker in town, and it also meant that none of the other girls would. And she told her what she wanted. It wasn't going to be just any old ordinary dress. She wanted something fashionable, something taken from the fashion papers from New York, or better yet, Paris. And she knew what kind of fabric she wanted, too. She wanted blue silk. Blue to match her eyes, and silk to rustle deliciously when she danced. Well, the dressmaker said she could do it, but it would take time, and it would cost a lot of money. Well, Charlotte waved her hand dismissively. That was no problem. Whatever it cost, she'd be happy to pay. So that was taken care of. And then she moved down to the next most important thing on her list. And that, of course, was the escort for the ball. And here again, looks were the important thing. And so it was clear to her that the only one that she wanted was Charlie. He was good looking. He was tall and handsome with dark hair and a dazzling smile. He was nice and could be very charming. Not extraordinarily bright, but as I said, that wasn't the thing about it. 
And so she began to flirt outrageously with him. In fact, as she was so successful in her flirtation that within the week, he asked her to accompany him to the ball. And if she kept it up at that same level, he probably would have asked her to marry him. But that wasn't what she wanted, so she kind of talked it down a little bit. Well, those were the first two things on her list. And then she went to the next ones. The jewelry, the hair, the shoes. She checked them off one at a time. And as the day of the ball came nearer, there was only one thing that concerned her. It was on her list, but it wasn't within her control. And that was the weather. Well, of course in Maine, at the around New Year time, it's always cold. But even the old timers said that they'd never seen a winter like that. The snow arrived earlier and was deeper and colder than anyone could remember. And for a time, there was talk that they might cancel the ball on account of the weather. But that didn't happen, and uh, Charlotte was pretty relieved about that. She told her mother that she had plans. She wanted, more than anything, that when she and Charlie entered that ballroom, she wanted every head to turn and look their way. She wanted every eye to open wide. She wanted to hear an audible gasp. Well, the night of the ball came. Charlie arrived, and Charlotte made her big entrance down the curved staircase. Well, the dress turned out even better than she hoped. It was gorgeous. The skirt was layer after layer of blue silk ruffles, and not, and not gathered ruffles, but pleated ruffles. It had taken their, their maid all day to iron in those things. The bodice fit her form and enhanced it. The neckline plunged daringly. It was lined with ruffles as well. When she reached the bottom of that staircase, she could see by the look on Charlie's face that her dress had had its expected impact. She took his arm and she said, let's go. And her father said, now young man, take good care of my daughter. He said, oh, I will, sir. And her mother said, Charlotte, uh, it's really cold out there. Wear this. And she held up a long woolen coat. Charlotte waved her mother away. No, I'm not going to wear that. It would crumple my, my dress. I, I'd get to the ball looking like a, 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 a dish rag. No, it's, it's not that far. I'd be fine. And before her mother could protest more, they swept out the door and into their conveyance for the evening. Not a carriage, but in that time and in that place and for that occasion, a one-horse open sleigh. <laughs> so Charlie uh, helped her up to her side of the seat and then went around to his side and uh, got in the, in the seat and he said, let's go. He gave the reins a shake and they were off. But about five miles from her house, he said, Charlotte, it is so cold. He reached behind the seat and he pulled out a thick woolen blanket. And he said, I know you don't want to wear a coat, but at least wrap this around you. It's really cold. And she said, oh, I'm not going to, I'm going to wrap that around me. Not that smelly old hunting blanket. No, but it is cold. You could go faster. Well, he gave the reins another shake and they went faster. And about five more miles, he, he reached under the seat and pulled out a lap robe. It was a buffalo robe with a buffalo hide on it. He said, at least put this around you. And she said, oh, that smelly, shaggy old thing. I'd rather die than have that around me. Uh, anyway, I, I think I'm feeling warmer now. But hurry. Yeah, he urged the horses to go as fast as they would go. And finally, they pulled up in front of the governor's mansion. It was a big, beautiful home. And it was all set for the party that there was light and music and laughter streaming out of all the windows. And Charlie stopped in front and handed the reins to a servant and went around to Charlotte's side and he held up his hand. He said, Charlotte, let's go in there. It looks warm. Give me your hand. But she didn't take his hand and she didn't say anything. He said, come on, Charlotte. I, I, I can wait. It's so cold. Take my hand. But she didn't take his hand. She didn't say anything. Come on, Charlotte, he said, and he grabbed her hand. And even through the thick gloves he was wearing, he could tell that her hand was cold, really, really cold, and stiff, too. And 
He picked her up in his arms and, and he ran into the ballroom. And when he came in the ballroom carrying Charlotte, well, all the heads turned toward them. All the eyes opened wide. And there was an audible gasp. Exactly what she wanted, but not quite the way she wanted it. Well, they did what they could, but she could not be revived. And there was nothing for Charlie to do at that point but to just take her back to her parents. When he carried her into her parents' house, her mother screamed and fainted. She never regained consciousness, and she died a couple of days later. Now her father, having lost his only child and his wife in one terrible evening, he completely lost heart, and he sold his business, and he sold his house, and he moved west. And nobody ever really heard from him again. And so that's the story of Frozen Charlotte. But it's not exactly all of the story. Because, you see, a small article appeared in a local newspaper. This is back in 1840. And uh, it might not have been noticed by many people, but it was noticed by Seba Smith, who was a local poet. And he wrote a long narrative poem telling the story of Fair Sean. And then a year or so later, that was set to music by a songwriter. And so it was that the story and the poem and the song traveled west with all of the immigrants and the pioneers. But there was something else that made it really catch hold. And that was a doll. And I brought a few of those to show you. A little doll was called a frozen Charlotte doll. They were imported from Germany and from England by the thousands. Sometimes they were called penny dolls because they were very, very inexpensive. And so because they were small and portable, and because they were inexpensive, and because they were available everywhere, every little girl, in, from about 1840, 1845, till the early 1900s had one or two or a dozen. In some ways, it was kind of like the Barbie doll of that time. Everyone had one. And uh, they, they arrived naked, of course, and little girls would spend their time making outfits for them out of scraps of lace or ribbon. And they traded back and forth and, and dressed the dolls they would often tell the story of Frozen Charlotte. And as you can imagine, it was a nice, shivery story with sort of a, a, a grim ending, just the sort of thing you'd like to tell when you're with friends. And uh, interestingly enough, the parents never complained about that story because, of course, they told what bad things could happen to you if you didn't obey your parents. If you didn't take their good advice, you could end up like poor Charlotte. And, um, and so I have, this is an original one. You can buy them one at a time or buy the dozens on the internet. Lots of times they're broken. In fact, some people, you can, you can buy a, a lot of, say, 50 heads, <laughs> which some people like to do and put into kind of spooky looking jewelry. So this is an original. And uh, this one, a little bit smaller, they usually range from under an inch to maybe five or six inches. Some even taller, although those weren't really appropriately called Frozen Charlotte dolls. This one, as you can see, has facial features painted on, even little rosy cheeks and some nice black hair. And then uh, these two, I have two of these, was what first got me interested in the story of Frozen Charlotte. I purchased these in, uh, in a museum in Kansas City, Missouri. It seems that in 1856, a steamboat, the steamboat Arabia, sank. It hit a snag in the river and sank. And it was just recovered in um, the 1990s. And the reason people had looked for it, mainly because there was a whole lot of really fine liquor that was apparently, had, so they said, went down with the ship. And people wanted that as an addition to whatever else they had. Somebody said it was kind of like a Walmart sinking because it was everything people needed to set up a new house, a new household, a new business in the West. And so if you go to this museum, it's just so interesting because 
when these brothers dug it up. They were sort of fortune hunters. They were planning to sell what they found, but they found so much, and it was in such good condition. The river had, had changed course over the years, and so they eventually located it about five miles away from the river, 30, mile, 30 feet deep down. And they began digging these things up, and they said, we can't sell this, we've got to keep it together. And people at museums have visited their museum and said, no, 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 you don't understand, that's not how you do it. If you've got 200 spoons, you take one, the best example, and you put it out in a case, and you put a little explanatory card next to it. They said, that's not what we wanted. So if they've got 200 spoons, they're in the museum, you got 200 spoons. <laughs> and you've got three barrels full of buttons. The, the fabric disintegrated, but the buttons are there. And they've got perfume that you can still smell. And it's just a really interesting place. And one of the things that they sell in the gift shop is a replica of their frozen Charlotte doll. And so these are those. I'll let you take a look at them if you want. In fact, I'll just pass them around. Why not? Oh, they're not so very valuable. But I mean, little girls have played with these for, for many, many years. So the, the story and the poem and the song and the girls, they came west with the pioneers. And I know that uh, early on when I was thinking about this story, I asked somebody at a historical event if, if they'd ever seen one of these little dolls. And they said, oh yes, um, I saw one here in Old Town. This was an event in Old Town. And so I went to see it. Sure enough, you know, in, in Old Town, a lot of times near some of the shops, they'll have a very small uh, historical section, a little museum. And there was one of the frozen Charlotte dolls in that. Not very long ago, I thought, well, if they've got one there, maybe they have one closer to me. I live in Penasquitas, near the Penasquitas Canyon Preserve, and I know they've done a lot of archaeological excavations there. And so I Googled that. Google is our friend, is it not? And I found out that certainly they have found the frozen Charlotte doll in some of their excavations there in Penasquitas. I called the... Um, the ranger station there, and I talked to Ranger Beth, and I said, I understand that there was a frozen Charlotte doll that was dug up here at the preserve. Do you have that? Is it on display? Can I see it? She said, that's true. We did find one. She said, it's not on display, though. It's probably in some archi county archive somewhere. I said, well, that's too bad. Seems like to me you should have that out on display, and then you could tell people that came to the preserve this interesting story. She said, well, I think so, too. She said, but how do you know that story? She said, are, are you a historian? I said, no, I'm a storyteller who's interested in history, not a historian who's interested in storytelling, but I'm interested in the story of it. And she gave me one other little tidbit. She said that there was a woman who'd lived on the Johnson Taylor Ranch um, who was still alive in the later part of the last century, and somebody had done an extensive interview with her. Yay, because isn't that what we hope for, right? Rather than people just shaking their heads and saying, you know, we should have asked that person. Yeah. Well, apparently they did. And one of the things they asked this woman named Evangeline, they asked her about the doll. They said they found this doll, and was it hers? And she said, a doll? No, certainly not. We were out on the ranch in the, in the summertime, and we worked from dawn till dusk. We had no time for foolishness like dogs. And whether that was true or not, you, you, you can judge. But she certainly disavowed any ownership of any frozen <laughs> Charlotte doll. So um, now that you know about the story, and maybe you knew the story before, I think it's like a lot of things. If, if you are become aware of something you've never heard of before, suddenly it is on every TV show, on every street corner, in every display, everywhere you go. And I think you will find that with this doll. I know that whenever I am reading in a, in a newspaper or a magazine or any kind of a, a record that has anything to do with archaeological excavations from, from the mid-1800s to the end of the 1800s, I always look for a photo or a mention of a small porcelain doll. And sometimes they know what they are, but a lot of times they don't. They just say, well, we found some, from uh, some toys, child, children's toys, like this little doll. And I look at the picture and I say, yeah, that's a frozen Charlotte doll. See how smart you will feel when you nod and say, that's a frozen Charlotte doll. I know about that. Anyway, the story of the song and the dolls, they traveled west. 
And uh, there was one other thing that got attached to the story of Frozen Charlotte. And I imagine that many of you are familiar with the dessert called the Frozen Charlotte. And it has some similarities. It's a fancy dessert, good for a fancy occasion, like a New Year's Eve ball. And it's cold, and it's rich, and it's pretty. But um, the people who knew the real Charlotte said that unlike that it's unlike the real Charlotte, in that the real Charlotte wasn't all that sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the story of their Charlotte, or Frozen Charlotte. A little bit of a San Diego connection, at least, but a connection really all over the place. Well, there's another story about, um, I'll just tell you, I talk, that's what I do. <laughs> so I'll just talk until I'm out of time, and then I'll stop, and if I don't look like I'm going to stop, just let me know. Just wave your hand and say, that was enough. That was enough. So a traveler to San Diego in the 1800s wrote back to friends back east that in his hotel room, he saw a basket of items that kind of made him wonder. It was eggshells blown with the contents blown out, but just sitting there in the basket. And he thought, what could anybody possibly want with those? And clearly, he was not acquainted with Cascarones. Do you know about Cascarones? <laughs> None of you. See, when I, you do have you. When, when I was a kid, I grew up in Pasadena, California, and in our school carnivals, they had Cascarones. It was a staple of our school carnivals. And so, but I hadn't thought of it for years until I read this little story. You take the eggs and you blow out the contents, then you fill the inside with confetti or sometimes perfumed powder. And then you close up the two ends with wax or with tissue paper. And then the idea is, well, like with most confetti, you use them at a party or a fiesta or a fandango. And in uh, San Diego at that particular time, the main use of them was for young men and young women who would throw them at each other or smash them on each other's heads, usually the people that they liked, to indicate their admiration. And it's kind of like what your mother used to say to you when you would say, oh, he knocked my books to the ground, and she would say, that shows he likes you. Sort of like that. Yeah. So people would amass piles of cascarones, and there was a particular season for that. It was from pretty much from the Dia de los Tres Reyes to the Semana Santa. So from winter to early spring. And they were so popular that they became quite expensive. It was not unheard of for people to pay a dollar a piece for a, a fine cascarone. And, uh, and eggs became quite expensive. And people said that if you wanted an egg to eat for your breakfast, the only way you could assure that you would get one would be to stand next to the chicken and <laughs> wait, for, wait for it to lay an egg and snatch it before others could get to it. In fact, there was a story that somebody had seen a man pawn his, his horse and saddle to get more money to buy more cascarones. That was how big they were. Well, this is a story of a German immigrant whose name was Buschen, and he was here in San Diego. And a single man, young man, looking for romance, and he caught the eye of a beautiful young woman named Rosa. She was the belle of the ball, long dark curls, flashing eyes, dazzling smile, very, very popular. He hoped that he would have a chance with her, but he didn't know if he ever would. One day, he found himself at a fandango where she was, and he watched her whirl around the, the floor, the dance floor, with one escort after another, dancing beautifully, but on one of her passes near him, well, she caught his eye, and she tossed a few cascarones his way, and he thought, oh, my chance. So he reached into his pocket, took out a cascarone, and when she came by again, he smashed it on her head, and uh, she shook her curls, and the, and the, uh, the confetti just whirled away, and, and she whirled away, and he reached into his pocket again so he could follow up, realized he had no Oh, but, but he had to do something. He had to take advantage of this opportunity. So he turned to the men near him and he said, does anybody have any cascarones they can lend me or sell me? I'll pay you well later. And an American, whose name was Nino, who was, he should have remembered, known for his 
practical jokes. He handed him a nice little painted cascarole. Just in time, Rosa came sweeping by, and he stepped up and smashed it on her head and realized as the eggshell broke that it was not hollowed out. It was a real egg, and it was really rotten. And so the sulfur smell filled the air, and the music stopped, and Rosa stood there with that orange goo dripping through her hair and down onto her dress and giving him a look that he knew. Any chance for romance there was over. In fact, the party was over, the fun was over, and he was the cause of it. Furious, he whirled around, located Nimmo in the crowd behind him, pulled out his gun and shot him in. Oh. Well, now his future didn't hold romance, his future hold, held arrest. And he was arrested, and he was taken to the authorities, but, According to what I read, they didn't put him in jail. They let him go because the general consensus was it had been totally justified. Self-defense. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a little story about Cascarones. Um, yeah, interesting. Let me look at my list to make sure what else I've got to tell you about so I don't miss anything. The story that begins with a poem. It could end with a poem, too, if I had a better memory. <laughs> the stories come down from the old ones that sometimes in the full moon's pale light, the spirit of Julian Chavez can be heard as he rides through the night. There's the clatter of hoofs in the courtyard, and the sound of a horse running fast, then fading into the distance, and a feeling that someone has passed. Now that is the beginning, the first couple of stanzas of a a long narrative poem written by Ken Graydon. Any of you know him? He passed away a few years ago. He was a, uh, a singer and songwriter. And I quote from this poem with his permission and that of his wife, Fee Sherline. There's a story of a man named Julian Chavez. Julian Chavez, here in San Diego. He was a horse thief. But he was no ordinary horse thief. He was not some disheveled thug that would just whack you over the head and take your horse. Not only in Chavez. He was a man of, it was suave and, and cunning and smart and witty and good looking. He always dressed in the finest clothes, impeccably dressed, impeccably groomed. His hair was red and he had a nicely trimmed goatee. He was a good looking man. And as for stealing horses, he was very good at it. In fact, people said that he was so smooth that he could steal the horse right out from under you and you wouldn't even know until you felt yourself hit the ground. <laughs> and he only stole the best horses. Only the best were good enough for Julian Chavez. Now the other principal in the story was a man named Cave Cots, and I imagine that many of you have heard of him. He owned Rancho, what is now the Rancho Buena Vista, and he had inherited it on his wedding from his wife's uncle. It was a wedding present. And there's a little interesting story about that. His wife was Isadora Bandini. I'm sure you know about the Bandinis. And the story behind this is that Isadora Bandini, that down in their house that, that still stands in Old Town, there was to be a parade. And of course, mostly back then, there weren't parades covered with floats covered with roses like I grew up with in Pasadena. But there were mostly military um, men, people on horseback and such. And uh, the Bandini family was gathered on, on the balcony of the second story of their house to watch the parade. Isadora was right there in front. And the way the story goes, when Cave Couts came riding down on his horse, she was taken by how handsome he was and how well he rode. And she leaned forward to get a better look, and she leaned a little bit more forward to get an even better look, and she leaned forward so much she lost her balance and fell right off the balcony and into his arms. <laughs> That's the story. But it's a pretty good story. Anyway, Ken Couts, he owned this large ranch, and he had made the most of it. He built a beautiful ranch house, and he had, uh, he had vineyards, he had an orchard, an, an orange grove that was uh, supposed to be the first commercial orange grove in San Diego County. And he had herds of, 
of uh, cattle, and he had really fine, fine horses. And that's where the two parts of this story intersect. One evening, there was a pounding on the gate there at the ranch house. One of the servants came out and, and opened the gate. And it was a stranger, nobody recognized. But he did have a badge that indicated that he was a deputy sheriff. And that made the uh, servant feel a little, a little better about letting him in. Now, in those days, you have heard the phrase, mi casa es su casa. That was really the case. If somebody came to your door, even if you didn't know them, you would welcome them in and treat them well. Anything else would have been a social disgrace. So the stranger was welcomed in, and uh, that night at dinner, another place was set, and the stranger ate as well as anyone in the household. And that night, a bedroom was cleared for him, and he slept as well as anyone in the household. Now, Cave Counts was away on business, but his son and heir, William, was there, and he met the stranger the next morning at breakfast. And after breakfast, he asked the stranger if he wanted a tour of the place. He was very proud of what they'd accomplished. And the stranger said he'd be happy to have a tour. And so the stranger was shown around the house and and the grounds, the orchard, the vineyard, the cattle in the distance, and then to the stables, where there was one stable after another of the finest horses. And at the end, William Counts asked the man what he thought. And he said, well, it's most impressive, most impressive. But I have a question for you. I have heard that you have a prize-winning stallion. And I was hoping to see that stallion when I came here. But I don't believe that he was with the others in the stables. Well, William Counts began to laugh, and he said, no, no, that stallion was not with the others. You see, that's our finest stallion, a real prize winner. And we have heard rumors that the uh, notorious bandit, El Rol, Julian Chavez, that he covets this stallion. And so to make sure that he cannot steal it, we bring the stallion into the house every night. He spends the night in my bedroom, sleeping next to my bed. And that way, you cannot be stolen. And uh, now it was the stranger's turn to laugh. And he swept the hat from his head, and there, in the morning light, you could notice what had been overlooked the night before, his bright red hair. And he laughed, and he said, Oh, senor, let me introduce myself. I am William Shaw. I am the one you fear. I came here to steal your horse, but you treated me like family. You gave me hospitality, you fed me, and gave me a comfortable bed to sleep in. And after I had experienced that, I could not steal a horse from you. I will give you my word on the honor of Julian Chavez that you and anyone in your household will never have anything to fear from me and my men. And so saying, he retrieved his horse and rode off. And William Counts was pretty relieved about that whole thing. And that might be the end of the story, but like with the other stories, there's always a little, a little um, extra touch at the end. You see, in the autumn in the ranchos around here, it was the custom, it was a requirement actually, that they round up all of their livestock every autumn. They only had a few days to do it. They would examine the animals, they would take inventory, they would pay any taxes that needed to be paid. Whatever needed to be done with the livestock would be done in the space of a few days in the autumn. And it was intensive, it was hard work, and so it required everybody, everybody on the rancho to really pitch in with some long days and into the night. And in fact, most, in mo most ranchos, they hired extra help. And, uh, and the, Ranch, ranch owners who were smart, they got the extra help secured pretty early before everybody else could, could hire everybody who was available. But one year, uh, I guess the Cowd's family was just not paying attention to the calendar, and so it came time for the roundup, and they didn't have any extra hands. They were really nervous, anticipating what it would take to get the job done. And then, uh, just before the roundup was to occur, there was a knock at the gate, and there were a half a dozen men standing there. I said, we heard you might need some help with the inventory. We've come to help. Mm -hmm. Well, Kate Coots was really, really relieved about that. 
He welcomed them in. He said, yes, I do need help. I can put you to work right away. They didn't decide on a price. But Kautz knew that it was going to be expensive. I mean, it was last minute, and they knew he was desperate. But whatever it took, he was going to have to pay that because he needed them that much. Well, they proved to be very experienced ranch hands. They worked hard. They worked efficiently. They took care of everything. And when finally the job had been accomplished, the foreman, the foreman of the ranch, went to the leader of these half a dozen men and said, your men have performed well. What do we owe you? Knowing that it would be expensive. And the leader of the men looked at him and said, for you, senor, no charge. We were sent here by Julian Chavez. He said to tell you that it was repayment for a courtesy years ago. And so that is a story of Julian Chavez, the bandit El Rojo. <laughs> Uh, so another story that I want to tell you, and it doesn't actually happen in San Diego, but I want to tell you because the main person in this story is my great-grandfather. This happened in the southern Utah territories, the last part of the 1800s, and the man's name was Thomas Waters Cropper. He had come across the plains when he was 12 years old, but at this point he was 19, tall, strong, and independent, a very capable young man. Um, and, of course, much larger than he had been when he came across the plains first at 12. But he heard that there was going to be a wagon train organized. It was going to be a huge wagon train. The area in the southern Utah Territory where they lived was called Dixie. And, in fact, it still is sometimes. There's a, a co college there called Dixie College. And people always speculate that it's because people from the south were the original settlers. Not that at all. It's because they grew cotton there. I don't know if they grow much cotton there now, but they did then. And one year they had a bumper crop and decided that they would take it back east, Missouri River, or they could take it up the river and sell it or trade it for the equipment that they couldn't get in the west. 78 wagons, mostly um, manned by older men, 30s, 40s, you know, older, more experienced. They had their own rigs. But there were a few wagons that needed drivers, and so Thomas stepped up and said he wanted to go. And he was very, very good at what he did, so they were happy to have him along. They had a little time before they were going to set out. And Thomas's mother looked at him, realized how much he'd grown and how ragged his clothes were. It's not like you could just go to the mall and buy new clothes. It was difficult to get clothes, and you kept them forever until they practically fell off your body. And his practically were doing that. The phrase was, a patch on a patch and a hole in the middle. <laughs> well, his mother figured that to be seen in any kind of decent company, he was going to at least need a new pair of pants. So she arranged with Mrs. Anderson, a neighbor, to weave the fabric. Can you imagine? You need a new pair of pants and you've got to start with weaving the fabric. And actually, Mrs. Anderson had started before that because the season before, she had obtained the cotton bowls and had carded them and had spun them into thread that was on skeins and was ready to be woven. So she set up a big frame, with large enough to make a, a large piece of fabric. She wove it fine and tight so that it would, be, it would wear well. And when she was done with the fabric, she gave it to Thomas's mother, who measured and cut very carefully to use the fabric in the most efficient way possible. And she made a pair of pants. She sewed them well. She wanted them to last for a long time, so with extra seam allowance and a turn up at the bottom. And when it was time to be on their way, well, Thomas didn't want to wear his new pants on the, on the trail, no need for that, so he wore his old patched clothes. But he put the new pants and his best shirt and a change of underwear and socks in a box in the, in the wagon, and they headed off. He was pretty excited when they came to their first stopping point, um, a trading post and a, and a city. And so when they stopped and were going to go in to see what the action was in the city, he bathed as well as he could and, and slicked down his hair and dressed in his fine new clothes, the new pants. And he walked toward the trading post. And as he walked along, a couple of the men, uh, seasoned veterans, sitting on a log, they saw him walk by. One of them called out, Who? Wait, will you look at that? Where do you suppose that boy got them pants? Oh, that his mama made them for him. Oh, no, I didn't tell you. They were dyed sort of a light green with a local. Um, Local shrub, rabbit rush. He said, look at that green. That shouldn't be on any real man. Well, that 
got Thomas's attention, he turned toward him and he said, well, what would a real man be wearing? I said, well, real man? Real man would be wearing buckskin pants like mine. There's no wear out to them. That's what a real man would wear. Well, where would I get some of those, said Thomas. <coughs> well, now, son, this is your lucky day. I'm kind of tired of these here buckskin pants. I tell you what, I'll do you a favor. I'll trade you my buckskins for those green pants of yours. Tom said, I don't know. I said, well, just come here behind this bush. You can try them on and see what you think. So Thomas went behind the bush, took off the green pants, handed them to the man, and waited until the last second. And he took off the buckskin pants, slipped on Thomas's pants, and he was gone. Thanks, kid. See ya. Mm. Well, Thomas pulled on those buckskin pants, and he realized immediately he'd made a big mistake. <laughs> They had been wet and dried and wet and dried. They were stiff as a board. They could stand on their own. They, uh, they hit him in all the wrong places. The man had been shorter and stouter than Thomas, and so they ended about halfway up his calf, and, and the little parts were pooched out for the knees. That was about halfway up his thigh. That waist was baggy, and it kind of pooched out in the back, and he thought uh, he couldn't appear anywhere in those. There was nothing really to be done but to go back to his own wagon put on his old patched clothes, and sit there feeling like a fool. But as he sat there, he had time to think. He thought about why he wouldn't be taken in like that again. And uh, then an idea came to him. So taking the pants, he smoothed them out as best he could. He took his pocket knife, and very carefully, he cut the threads in the seams. And then, then he, he went out out of the wagon down by the riverside, and he got some willow sticks, nice stout sticks, chopped them with his camp axe, and then trimmed them up with his, with his pocket knife. So they're about two and a half feet long, pretty standard. And then he took them back to his wagon. Then he took the little strips of leather that he cut from those buckskin pants, eight strips, tacked them onto a piece of wood, and began to braid a nice tight brown braid, enough to make a bullwhip. Fringed the ends, attached it to one of those willow sticks, wrapped the end of that to secure the, the, the whip, and he looked at it. It was a nice bullwhip. It was definitely worth the two dollars that he was going to ask for it. Well, he didn't make another whip that night, but he did cut the strips out because he had a plan. You see, we talk about the dangers of multitasking when you're on the road. But back then, there was not so much danger. It was slow going, and if you were in a train of 78 wagons, all you had to do pretty much was keep your wagon right behind that wagon in front. And your team knew kind of how to do that. You just had to you know, look up from time to time to make sure everything was OK. It's not like there were a lot of distractions, not like there were a lot of side roads for them to get lost. Pretty steady, pretty boring. So he used that time to break nine other bull whips. And then he made a little sign that said, whips, two dollars, put it on his wagon. The whips sold like that, fast as he could make them. And so he had $20 in his pocket when they stopped at the next trading post. He was pretty excited about that. I mean, he was dressed in his old patch clothes, but he had money in his pocket. So he walked in, wanted to be sure that uh, He'd get the best advantage that he could. He, he watched for a while to see how that trading post <coughs> went. And he finally went up to one of the clerks, a young man about his age, about his size. And he told him what he needed. And so over the course of the next few minutes, he bought a suit of clothes, pants and a jacket, $12. A new shirt, $2. Some uh, shoes, 85 cents. And uh, socks, 15 cents. And then with the extra money, he bought a few gifts for his brothers and sisters and his mom back at home and a box to hold it all in. Well, the clerk said, did he want everything in the box? And Thomas said, no, he wanted to wear the new clothes out the door. Have you ever done that? Just been so excited about something you bought, you just wore it right on out the door? Well, so he went out the door with his old clothes and the gifts in a box, looking pretty great. And as he walked back to his wagon, he encountered those same two guys sitting on another log, a lot like the log they'd been sitting on when he first met them. And uh, when they watched him walk by, he didn't turn and acknowledge that they were there. He just kept walking. One of them called out, 
Hoo-wee, will you look at that? Hey kid, where'd you get them fancy duds? Without breaking a stride, without looking to the side, Thomas just said, these? Oh, I got these in trade for a pair of buckskin pants. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the story about Thomas Waters coming in like, Great grandfather, I don't think he ever went to San Diego. Probably would have liked it. Oh, we all pretty much like it here, don't we? So um, I'm coming up sort of on the end. I know that Vincent said no more than an hour. My husband said they mean no more than an hour. <laughs> I said I could do that. Well, here is a little story that is um, that is a story that floats around. It's hard to really pinpoint it. It's hard to pin it down. I can know exactly where it came from, or if it ever happened at all. But like I said, I'm a storyteller that likes history, not necessarily a historian that likes storytelling. So I, I, it could have happened here. It could have. Any place where there are large cattle ranches, in the last part of the 1800s. The day came. It had been, times have been tough. There had been a drought. We know about that, right? Even though we don't have cattle, we know that this can be a problem. And so everybody was suffering. And one afternoon, a ranch owner called his foreman in, a man named Joe. He said, Joe, it's time. I got to sell the herd. He said, we got to hunker down. I, we'll keep a few for a seed herd for when times get better. But I got to sell most of them. So round them up, you and the boys, round them up, take them into the city and sell them for the best price you can get. And let the boys go. I won't be needing them around here anytime soon. He said, it's a hard job, it's got to be done. And Joe said he could do it. And so he told the boys that night. And the next morning, they got up early, rounded up all the cattle, and took them into the city. Well, he let the boys go, paying them a little extra with his good wishes for future. And then it took Joe a few days to really get all those cattle sold for a good price. During the day, he would negotiate and during the evening, it wasn't so bad. He was staying at a hotel, a nice, comfy bed. And, and in the evening, there was good food and drink and card tables there in the hotel. And on the last night he was there, after he'd concluded his business, he, uh, he hit a, a streak of luck, and he won $100. So he was pretty happy about that. When he, next day, he went on back to the ranch. The first thing he did was he reported to the rancher he uh, showed him the accounts of what he'd done and the prize that he'd gotten. And the rancher said, thanks, I really appreciate it. He said, now, I need to go take care of a little bit of business. I'll, I'll be back for supper. And he went right away to the local saloon where he talked to the proprietor, Miss Sally. And he said, Sally, I know that last night before we went to the city, the boys, the boys were not in a happy mood and, and they kind of tore things up around your place. I can't replace everything, but uh, I won this $100. And I'll give that to you, and you can use it to fix things up that were broken. She was mighty grateful about that. But uh, as soon as Joe was gone, she went over to the hat rack, put on her bonnet, and she walked down the street to the grocer. And she said, the grocer, I know I owe you money. I know you've been running an account for me. He said, yeah, you and everybody else in town, I know times are tough. She said, well, they are, but I've come into this hundred dollars and I want you to put this against what I owe you. Well, he thanked her. And after she left, well, he went down to the undertakers. And when he saw the undertaker, he said, you know, times are tough. When my mama passed away last winter, well, we couldn't afford any kind of services. But you were so kind. You gave her a fine, dignified send-off. Didn't charge us a cent. I want you to take this hundred dollars for that. Well, when he was gone, the undertaker, he took that hundred dollar bill down to the livery stable where they kept his black horses in oats and hay, even when he couldn't pay. And he gave the owner of the livery stable that hundred dollars. The livery stable owner was thankful and relieved. And he took that hundred dollars out to the farmer where he got the oats and the hay, and the farmer who was running an account for him. The farmer, he was also grateful and relieved, and, and, and as soon as the livery stable owner was gone, he took that hundred dollars to the man that he leased his farm land from, the rancher. 
Well, that night, there on the ranch, at supper time, there weren't too many people there. Just the ranch owner and Joe and a few others. And when dinner was over, the ranch owner stood and he said, I, I want to pay tribute to you, Joe, and thank you. You had a hard job to do, and you did it well. I want to thank you for your loyalty and, and, and your vision. He said, and so in addition to your regular pay, I want to give you this bonus. And he handed him that same $100 bill. <laughs> he said, now I've got a favor to ask you. I kind of hate to ask since you just come back from the city. But I understand that there's to be a storm tonight. Thunder, lightning, and I'd hate for those few cattle that we have left to be spooked by that and to run off. We're going to need them when it's time to start in again. So if you could, could you spend the night out by where the cattle are? Just make sure that everything's all right and that they stay safe. And Joe said, of course. I'd be happy to do that. Anyway, I, I was getting kind of tired of that cushy hotel bed. So I'd be happy to go spend the night with the cows. And he picked up a bedroll and a few provisions, and he walked out on the range to where the last of the herd was located, rolled out his blanket, built a little fire. He heated up some water, made some coffee. And as he sat there by the campfire sipping his coffee, he thought about the events of the past week and everything that had happened. And he reached into his pocket, and he took out that $100. He held it up to the light, examined it. Then he held it down to the campfire, close, too close really. <laughs> One of the edges caught on fire. And he held it as it went up in flames, dropped the last bit into the coals and watched it disappear. And then he sat back with a satisfied sigh and a smile. Because you see, he figured that that $100 bill had done about as much good as any $100 could do in the space of one afternoon. And anyway, he'd known it was counterfeit when he first won it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the story. <laughs> I do appreciate it. And if you've got some good stories, send them on. You can always use a few good stories. Thank you for having me come. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, Any questions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. How, how did you get into doing this? That's really uh, <laughs> by accident, basically. I mean, maybe some of you have occupations that you've fallen into by accident, too. But um, when I moved to Penasquitas, I had five children in eight years. I was looking for a break, my first two children a year apart, and so as soon as they were old enough, I enrolled them in a preschool. It was what I could afford, it was close by, a parent participation preschool at, um, at right there in, in Poway School District. And when they were serious about the participation thing, you sign your kid up, you sign yourself up too. And so they handed me a three-page list of stuff that you could do to pay for your child's tuition, which was insanely low. And some of them, the first thing was clean the bathrooms every week. And I, no, 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 I, I do that at home. And one of them was to sand down the playground equipment and repaint it, and that sounded hard. But on about the middle of the third page, it said tell stories every week. I thought, well, that sounds easy enough. I think I could do that. <laughs> and I liked it so much that every semester, I would sign my kids up, and I would make sure I got there early so I could sign up for my favorite job so I didn't get stuck doing the bathrooms. And then uh, somebody came to me one day and said that the woman who did the story time at the library was moving. And she said, I think that that's something you might like. And I thought, well, yeah, I would. So I've been telling, doing story time at my library for, well, more than 30 years. Nobody knows exactly how long. It's got to be, yeah, 32, 33, maybe. Nobody else has been there that long. But I still do that, and I enjoy it a lot. And then people started calling from schools and organizations and things like that. So, yeah, so now I'm, I'm deep into storytelling. And, and as you mentioned, I'm the Pacific Region Director for the National Storytelling Network. So there's, there's storytelling going on everywhere, as there always has been. What time at the library? What time at the library? It's on Thursdays at 9.45. Yeah. And I, I, I've been at the Ranch Bernard Library several times, too, not too recently, but you know, a lot of other places. One thing I would like to tell you about is that Storytellers in San Diego, we have an annual storytelling festival. It's free to the public, and it's also at a library. It's at the Encinitas Library. If you have ever been there, you know it's gorgeous. They've got a, an ocean view. 
who, who what libraries have worship views. Very, very nice. But it's on Saturday, March 18th, and it's from 10 in the morning till 6 at night. Different things every, every hour for kids, for families, for adults. Um, I should have brought flyers. Well, I can tell you more about it if you, if you want to know. But there are, always, there are always things, storytelling things. People say that the renaissance of American storytelling came uh, in, the, in the late 60s and early 70s, you know, with macrame and the whole folk music. Uh, movement. Macrame is pretty much gone, but storytelling is still around. <laughs> so I know that some of the big festivals in, in the country uh, get crowds of 10,000 at a wow. time. Wow. Because nobody is too old or too young for a good story. I really believe it. It's the way that for thousands of years people have been communicating, and it loses nothing, but only draws on new technologies and new things that are around. There's always room, always room for a good story. You can find me at MarilynMcPhee.com, and you can find uh, a lot of things that are happening storytelling-wise in San Diego at www.storytellersofsandiego.org. So, thanks so much. Appreciate it.